3. Coming up next on The Presidency, author Catherine Clinton chronicles the changing historical narratives about President Lincoln's wife, Mary. She considers how Mary would have been remembered if she had died instead of her husband, and also talks about why some of her critics have labeled her as crazy. Southern Methodist University's Center for Presidential History hosted this hour and 10 minute event. Well, it's not only an honor and a privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, it is for me a personal delight because she and I were classmates in Princeton's graduate history program many years ago. Catherine Clinton is the Gilbert Denman and Dow Professor in American History at the University of Texas at San Antonio, and she is also one of this country's most distinguished historians of American women, the South, and the Civil War. She's a proud daughter of Kansas City, Missouri, and she studied as an undergraduate at Harvard, studied American history, and then went for her PhD at Princeton, completing her dissertation on the direction of James McPherson, the famed Civil War historian. Her dissertation would be published in 1982 as the book, The Plantation Mistress, Women's World in the Old South, which is her first work to be characterized justly as pioneering. Drawing on the diaries, letters, and memoirs of hundreds of planter wives, the plantation mistress, wrote Eric Foner for the History Book Club, challenges and interprets a host of issues related to the Old South. The book forces us to rethink some of our basic assumptions about two peculiar institutions, the slave plantation and the 19th century family. As a result, it permanently alters our understanding of the Old South and women's place in it. Catherine would go on to author or edit, by my count, some 17 additional books, uh, all of which Fondren Library holds, I'm glad to say, and several of which became history book club selections. These include a biography of Harriet Tubman, the Moses-like conductor of the Undergra Underground Railroad, which both the Christian Science Monitor and the Chicago Tribune put on their lists of the best works of nonfiction in 2004. More recently, of course, she's published Mrs. Lincoln, A Life, which we've made available for book signing out on the balcony after the lecture. Um, this volume, says none other than Doris Kearns Goodwin, is an engaging, wonderfully written narrative that provides fresh insight into this complex woman. It is a triumph. And according to Pulitzer Prize winning historian Joseph Ellis, the biography, quote, is distinctive for its abiding sanity, its deft and in-depth handling of the White House years, and for the consistent quality of the prose. Along the way, Professor Clinton has also written several history books for children, and she has worked as a consultant on two Academy Award winning movies, 12 Years a Slave and Steven Spielberg's Lincoln. She's been an on-screen commentator as well for various documentary films, including The Time of the Lincolns for PBS's American Experience series, and her lectures are often broadcast on BBC and C-SPAN, as this one will be. Before coming to UTSA, she taught at Harvard, Brandeis, the Citadel, Wesleyan, and Queen's University uh, in Belfast, Northern Ireland, Ireland. And finally, not long ago, she was elected by her peers and is now serving as president of the Southern Historical Association, a richly deser deserved capstone recognition for her career achievements in her field of endeavor so far. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Catherine Clinton. Well, I... I I am worn out after hearing all these things, but thank you, Tom, for that very warm introduction. I'm very, very pleased to return to the SMU campus where I have enjoyed my visits before, and now that I'm a Texan, it's even easier to uh, make my way here. So thanks for making me feel so welcome. I'm pleased in this sesquicentennial year of Abraham Lincoln's birth um, to talk about a topic, Mary Lincoln's assassination. 
Americans are naturally focused on honoring the memory of the fallen leader, and his legacy remains daunting, particularly for American historians, called to fuel the insatiable hunger for new books on Lincoln. But at this moment in Lincoln's legacy, it might behoove us to look at the impact of Lincoln's death 150 years ago on another key player in the Civil War White House, Mary Lincoln. It is my hope that from the vantage point of a century and a half, we can find a more authentic narrative to appreciate what I have come to call Mary Lincoln's assassination. I'm not trying to seek equality, parody, or any other false construct for Mrs. Lincoln as an historical figure, but I do think a more judicious appreciation of her role in Lincoln's life and legacy would be served by examining what I call a 3D approach. The three dimensions I recommend are, one, the experience of Mary Lincoln on the night of April 14, 1865, and subsequent trauma. Two, the scrutiny and vitriol endured by Lincoln's wife, particularly while in the White House, and then carving out a place for herself as first widow. And three, the character assassination heaped on Mary most blatantly by a parade of Lincoln scholars. So I hope to weave all of these elements together to create a more three-dimensional look at her legacy. The full dimensions of the 16th president's death are well chronicled. There are over 600 titles available in the Library of Congress, but Mary's side of the story, the full impact of the tragedy for the First Lady, remains relatively underexplored. Although a new play, The Widow Lincoln, commissioned by Ford's Theater, premiered earlier this year, Mary Lincoln had influence over Lincoln's legacy, most particularly his association with black rights as the martyr president gunned down by an opponent of the black vote. On April 11, 1865, just two days after Lee surrendered to Grant, Lincoln addressed a gathering crowd from the White House balcony. Lincoln knew reconciliation between former enemies would be challenging, but he discussed the need for cooperation and mentioned the possibility of black veterans voting. Lincoln ended his speech by suggesting there would be further developments. As historian Vernon Burton has suggested, one man in the audience understood perfectly what Lincoln intimated. John Wilkes Booth told his companion it meant black citizenship and confided, now by God, I'll put him through. That's the last speech he will ever make. Historians continue to debate the myriad reasons why Lincoln was killed, but recent scholarship has confirmed that Lincoln's assassination was at a minimum politically motivated, at a maximum a hate crime that elevated him to our first civil rights martyr. As Burton reminds us, Lincoln is part of a long list of martyrs who died for black voting rights. Medgar Evers, Viola Liuzzo, James Cheney, Andrew Goodwin, Michael Schwerner, Martin Luther King Jr., and tragically, so many more. Booth's misguided attempts to rouse the defeated South to carry on their revolutionary rebellion backfired when his murder of the president on Good Friday took on religious dimensions and mourners across the world from Black Easter forward, linked his death to that of Jesus. To Mary Lincoln, it was a terrible fulfillment of premonition which had haunted her for years. It was the event which divided her life into before and after, a wound which would not heal. How did she experience the death of her husband, something which nearly half a million wives had suffered in the past half decade? Not well, indeed extremely poorly, And it was this initial period of grief that signaled that she would endure a loss of her protector as well as any comfort or joy. Lincoln and his wife had arrived late at Ford's Theater on the night of Friday, April 14, 1865. Their entrance interrupted the action on stage as the band struck up, Hail to the Chief. And Lincoln and their guests, Clara Harris, the daughter of a senator, and her fiance, Major Henry Rathbone, settled into seats in the presidential box. Celebrated actress Laura Keene was playing a starring role in Our American Cousin. The play was a popular standard, but the Lincoln's presence turned the evening into an exuberant patriotic occasion 
Lincoln was a very devoted theater goer, having attended plays more than 100 nights during his presidency. But with peace declared, this evening promised to be jubilant. Mrs. Lincoln was particularly relieved because her son Robert had just returned home from active duty. She and her husband had fought bitterly over his enlistment, but harmony was restored with his safe return. Lincoln had written his wife a playful note that day to invite her on a drive, and a gesture harked back to their youth. Their talk in the carriage outing was full of cheer, a quality that had too often eluded them during the previous four years. The president's very courtly attentiveness the engaged young couple who accompanied them to the theater enhanced Mrs. Lincoln's romantic mood. While watching the play, she'd been clinging to her husband's arm and teased him about what their guest, Miss Harris, might think of her, to which Lincoln replied, she won't think anything about it. These were his last words. Close to 10 p.m., John Wilkes Booth crept into the presidential box and fired his pistol directly into the back of Lincoln's head. Next, he attacked Henry Rathbone with a knife before leaping onto the stage, shouting, Sic Semper Tyrannus, always to tyrants, the Virginia State motto. Whether Booth hurt his leg in the fall from the box or during his escape on horseback remains a matter of dispute, as do so many of the events of that evening, dissolving into chaos, noise, blood. Everything went out of focus for Mary, except her husband's head, slumped forward on his chest, his limbs slack in the rocker. Witnesses all agree that Mrs. Lincoln's screams alerted the audience. Once she saw blood, Mary shrieked, they have shot the president. Watching a doctor unable to find her husband's pulse, a doctor attempting mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, followed by Lincoln's revived breathing, proved traumatizing, particularly for his wife nearby. She felt helpless as soldiers lifted her husband onto a litter, carried him across the street into a private house owned by William Peterson. During the ghastly scenes which unfolded, Mary wondered aloud why it was not she who was shot. And this has actually prompted me to look at a counterfactual issue in an article entitled Wife Versus Widow. Uh, how would history have judged Mary if it had been her instead of Lincoln who'd been shot that night? What kind of wife would she be viewed? What would her legacy be? But Lincoln alone was the one wounded and doctors agreed there was no expectation of recovery. As attendants warmed his limbs, changed his dressing, all except Mary recognized that the end was near. The cabinet gathered by Lincoln's bedside while Secretary of War Edwin Stanton issued orders and took charge, updating the outside world, trying to organize an unprecedented national manhunt to apprehend the assassin. The National Park Service preservation of the Peterson home allows visitors today to reimagine Lincoln's last hours as they entered the cramped bedroom at the rear of the house. Although many portraits included Mrs. Lincoln kneeling or sitting by the bed during Lincoln's final moments, the truth was that she had been banished from the room. She wanted to remain by her husband's side, but when she began to sob hysterically, she was taken to a nearby parlor. Near dawn, Mrs. Lincoln realized that her husband was not getting any better, but worse. She collapsed into the floor in a faint, and Edwin Stanton barked, Take that woman out, do not let her in again. The deathbed of a loved one involved the most hallowed of 19th century rituals. Mary's ancestors were Scotch-Irish, women who might keen for hours, if not days, over the body of a departing loved one. In Victorian America, attending a dying husband was a wife's most sacred duty and obligation, to press into her memory his final moments, to be there at the very end, Everyone crowded in that room that night knew a wife's privilege. When Lincoln's breathing became halting and labored around 7 a.m., no one summoned Mary. Instead, the Reverend Phineas Gurley suggested a prayer as more than a dozen men encircled their beloved leader. At 7.22 a.m., Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, was pronounced dead. Edwin Stanton uttered his famous tribute. Now he belongs to the ages. But forgotten are the words of Mary Lincoln, the wife kept from her husband.
When informed of his passing, she cried, oh, why did you not tell me he was dying? Her crying could be heard throughout the house, and it was her wails of grief that alerted those outside the Peterson home. Abraham Lincoln was gone. And it was in that moment, the circle of men surrounding Lincoln, expelling his wife from his dying bedside, that Mary's betrayal began. She became an exile within her own historical experience. With her husband's death, Mary was cast adrift, only able to imagine assuming her rightful place alongside her husband. Mary did not want to leave her husband, so she stayed on at the Peterson home another two hours. While Abraham Lincoln's reputation soared and has only grown more revered over the years, perhaps immortal in the American ima historical imagination, his wife's reputation has tumbled into a deeper decline. So the more immortal he becomes, the more infernal she has become. She became an object of pity, consigned to the sidebars of her husband's narrative text. Mary Lincoln did survive to attend one of her son's weddings, to see grandchildren born, to visit European capitals, of which she and her husband both had dreamed visiting together, to establish the rhythm and patterns of many war widows of the era. She dedicated herself to keeping his legend burnished, his halo polished, but simultaneously, she entered a series of crippling humiliations and losses. Contemporaries and scholars alike debate the relationship between Lincoln and his wife. Perhaps no other occupants of the White House have endured such media attention until the Kennedy White House of the 1960s and the media industrial complex which followed. But even this has been surpassed by the storms of speculation that engulfed the 42nd presidency, that of William Jefferson Clinton and his wife Hillary. As a, uh, a scholar of Mary Lincoln, I'm uh, irregularly called by the press to ask, you know, did Mary Lincoln ever throw a lamp at uh, President Lincoln and other keen historical insights that I'm not able to uh, answer. But nevertheless, it's important to see that Mary Lincoln's relationship with her husband continues to fascinate and, and really it perplexed people. The questions would follow. Did he love her first? Did he love her best? Did he love her at all? Was she the only woman who could cajole him from his crippling frequent bouts of melancholy and redirect him? toward his destined greatness in which she so firmly believed. Did she nag and abuse him and give him no peace? Was she a partner only for propriety's sake, a requisite vessel to produce the children he so cherished? Was Lincoln's desire for male companionship purely spiritual, or was there a physical component? Claims and counterclaims continue to shake, rattle, and roll Lincoln's scholarship. If we try to examine the facts of the Lincoln courtship, naturally disputes erupt. So I'm happy to answer any questions about this, but it's a rather uh, intricate and uh, quite hotly contested. And I would suggest, nevertheless, once the gold ring was slipped on Mary's finger during the ceremony in November of 1842, the two entwined their fates, allowing the pushing currents to, to stir within them, and they flowed together forward. Mary was her husband's sounding board for every speech. She was deeply partisan blindly loyal, held fierce grudges. Advice would flow freely as they read the papers aloud to one another daily. Mary believed she'd married a diamond in the rough, and she spent a good deal of her energy polishing that diamond. In 1858, Lincoln confided laughingly to a journalist, Henry Villard, that his wife had insisted that he would eventually be president of the United States. Even Mary's critics gave her credit for playing a crucial rise. A, pu a crucial role in the rise of Lincoln in political fortunes in the 1850s. Her scheming helped Lincoln attain his nomination as Republican presidential candidate. They were jubilant at his election. When New England aristocrat Edward Everett spoke at Gettysburg during Lincoln's famous 1863 address, he enjoyed getting to meet the president. Mary would have loved Everett's estimation that the polish Abraham Lincoln had acquired, Everett wrote to someone, may be credited to the influence of his wife. Yet her husband's election put her under the microscope as press coverage became relentless during the winter of 1860-61. Those who wished to set a house on fire began with the thatch. So the First Lady became an easy target for the Lincoln presidency. She felt herself in a fishbowl. One journalist recalled, 
If she drives down Pennsylvania Avenue, the electric wire trills the news to every hamlet in the nation. When the Lincolns arrived at the White House, Harriet Lane, President James Buchanan's niece, wrote cattily, Mrs. Lincoln is awfully Western, loud, unrefined. At one of Mrs. Lincoln's first receptions in March 1861, British journalist William Howard Russell found the attendance was very scanty. The Washington ladies have not yet made up their mind. Is Mrs. Lincoln going to be the fashion? They miss their southern friends, and they draw comparisons between them and the vulgar Yankee women who are now in power. Some of the earliest press reports portrayed Mary as incapable of measuring up to refined Eastern standards, and Mrs. Lincoln was quite offended by these cold shoulders and very intent upon proving her critics wrong. So the new First Lady believed that the White House should be a shining symbol of a great nation, especially when peril abounded. Yet the executive mansion was shabby. Her Springfield relations came and complained that the place was no better than a second-rate hotel. Congress had approved $20,000 for White House refurbishing, which I compared to other congressional appropriations. For example, it was considerably less as well than the $125,000 appropriated to Andrew Johnson's family, who would next come in. Mary Lincoln sought the advice of a commissioner of building for the district, William S. Wood. Wood was a former hotel manager and tour operator. I think operator being the, uh, the main word here. He'd been drafted by New York party boss Thurlow Weed to assist the Lincolns. He wheedled for permanent appointment. He peddled his influence. He pocketed kickbacks. In May 1861, one particularly outraged New York reporter voiced his disdain. She spends thousands and thousands of dollars for articles of luxurious taste. Her kinswoman, Lizzie Grimsley, who'd accompanied her on this trip to Manhattan, was adamant in her cousin's defense. Mary did not indulge in one hundredth part of the extravagance with which she and I were credited. Now, she did select fine Haviland china in Solferino with gilt decor for state occasions. Solferino and chartreuse were new colors named after European battles, and she designated this with the seal of the U.S. on each piece. Presidential China was nothing new. This was the very same pattern I uh, saw that was selected by First Lady Michelle Obama at the inauguration luncheon for her husband in January of 2009. What is remembered is neither Mrs. Lincoln's taste nor her patriotism, but that she ordered a second set at a cost of $1,100 emblazoned with her own initials. Grimsley insisted that this was not paid for by the district commissioner, as was most unkindly charged. Lincoln's rival, Secretary of Treasury Salmon Chase, fueled rumors about Mary's extravagance and her financial irregularities. Chase regaled his daughter with tales of Mrs. Lincoln's avarice, her overspending, scandalous reports about Mrs. Lincoln, and Lincoln himself emanated from the Treasury Department. Newspapers full of allegations fueled the controversy and gossip had a field day. The First Lady may have been compromising the ethics to which her husband su subscribed, particularly frugality. However, there's no evidence to suggest she participated in any criminal conspiracy. Wood was actually investigated for bad financial practices, removed from office. Naturally, not only was this uh, called a conspiracy, but there were those who intimated that there was an uh, intimate conspiracy between the two. And critics continued to spread stories to such a degree that the editor of the New York Herald complained in October about the abuse heaped on the First Lady. But she remained at the center of media controversy and bad press, even her husband's own staff referred to their boss's wife as Hellcat. She suffered, we know, severe mood swings, first after the death of Willie in February 1862, and then following a head injury from a carriage accident in June 1863. A carriage accident, by the way, which happened when the carriage was sabotaged. It was Lincoln's carriage. It was assumed that this was an attempt on his life, but instead his wife had <coughs> a life-threatening injury to the head, and thereafter her own son said that she was considerably altered. In 1864, when she went on another shopping spree in Manhattan, the papers took aim. Mrs. Lincoln ransacked the treasury of the Broadway dry goods stores. 
<coughs> Washington political hostess Marianne Clemmer Ames complained, while her sister women scraped lint, the wife of the President of the United States spent her time rolling to and fro between Washington and New York, intent on extravagance for the White House. The New York Times reported austerity campaigns among the well-heeled ladies. They boycotted imported fabrics for the duration of the war. Mrs. Lincoln countered by talking to congressional members who said it would bolster the U.S. economy if she were to buy foreign goods, and so indeed she did. She invested in her own agenda and demanded and received confirmation that what she did was to actually be a patriot during this period. But we know that she was quite worried at the debts that she had run up. She saw the re-election campaign in 1864 quite crucial to her personal relations as well as the relations of the nation. The crushing debts that she feared uh, would not come due when her husband won. And with peace, Mary felt that she and her husband would be able to enjoy life. But with her husband's death on the heels of surrender, Mrs. Lincoln became notorious, eccentric, derided. Her bad press during the war was nothing compared to the melodramas as a widow. Most prominent claims by her husband's former partner that Lincoln's sweetheart from New Salem, Ann Rutledge, was the former president's one true love. Equally damaging were claims by Lincoln's business associate that the president's widow was a blackmailing harridan besmirching her husband's memory in 1867 by trying to pawn her jewelry and wardrobe with the old clothes scandal, as the press dubbed the episode. Political enemies suggested that she did not deserve sympathy or financial support. When Lincoln died, there was no widow's pension, and her husband's estate was tied up with lawyers for over two years. She was in a state of severe dislocation following her husband's death. Once her older son Robert married in 1868, she took her son Tad to Europe for his education. Homesick, the two returned to Robert's home in Chicago in 1871, but shortly thereafter, Tad fell ill, and his death hit his mother and brother very hard. A few years later, Mary Lincoln endured an embittering alienation from her only remaining son, Robert, when in 1875, he committed his mother against her will to an asylum, ostensibly for her own safety, but it was an act which caused incalculable damage to her esteem. And this also created a very permanent stain on her historical reputation. Not only the headlines in the 1870s, but I found more than 100 years later, whenever I went on my book tour, the first question I was always asked was, was she crazy? In the 1920s, while Lincoln biographers gathered momentum, his wife languished. Honoré Morrow claimed it began to look as if there were a conspiracy of silence about Lincoln's wife. Morrow began research on a biography and discovered Mary Todd Lincoln to be one of the most lied about women in the world. So uh, even in the 20s, they had the uh, publisher's hyperventilation uh, to, in order to get the story across. But 1928 was a very good year. It was when her niece, uh, Catherine Helm, published the true story of Mary, wife of Lincoln. And these volumes were intended to contradict the very harsh, unsympathetic portraits of Lincoln's wife in previous work. These studies were taking aim at negative images projected executed and supported by William Herndon. Certainly for the 19th century, this Lincoln biographer proved the most persistent and damning critic of Mary Lincoln. The reverberations from Herndon's charges are still very much with us. The personal antipathy between Lincoln's law partner and Lincoln's wife Mary has been well documented. She was um, the social center of, of Springfield during that time. We have records of her many uh, balls and parties cramming 300 people into that little house on the prairie. If you go out to Springfield and see, she was quite a hostess, but there is no record of Herndon being invited to the house. Um, in November, uh, of 1866, he gave his famous speech on Lincoln and Ann Rutledge, ushering in the Rutledge industry, uh, and it's perhaps his most enduring legacy. For Mrs. Lincoln, this was a full frontal assault, a shattering blow. The aforementioned volume by Morrow and Helm were joined by other rehabilitative work. 
including studies by William Evans and Carl Sandburg in 1932, Ruth Painter Randall in 1973, Justin and Linda Turner in 1972, Ishbel Ross in 1973, and Jean Baker in 1987. However, during the late 20th century, Michael Burlingame rejected any revisionist interpretations and replaced Herndon as Mary Lincoln's <coughs> harshest critic. Burlingame clearly places blame for misery within the marriage, which he says is a given, on Mary. In his thoughtful and important studies of Lincoln, Burlingame frequently introduces Mary Lincoln's shortcomings and the alleged disastrous effects on her husband beyond the confines of marital relations. For example, Burlingame suggests, in order to avoid conflict with his difficult wife, Lincoln spent an inordinate amount of time away from home. Such a tactic may have made his unfortunate marriage tolerable, but it deprived the children of much contact with their father. Lincoln's absenteeism may seem striking, but it might have been only a strategy for success as a lawyer on the circuit was frequently away from home. So the absence of context leads to, I believe, a rather biased view. Burlingame, Burlingame comments, the few surviving letters between the Lincolns do not suggest a deep love on either side, and goes on to state the most remarkable feature of that correspondence is its sparseness. Well, I agree that uh, there is a sparseness, but most of us in the field know that there was a burn pile outside of the Springfield home when they went west. Uh, and also, I would disagree, one of my favorite letters is when Lincoln is saying, oh, you're free of headaches, and then he goes on to ask, Mary, um, have you weighed yourself? And I always think, what kind of couple would be seen <laughs> as not compatible when a wife would, uh, would jolly with her husband about her weight? Um, but in the 21st century, C.A. Tripp, the author of The Intimate World of Abraham Lincoln, has surpassed Burlingame as Mary Lincoln's most rapid detractor. As Jean Baker argues, he uses the familiar rants of previous historians and employs selective evidence to eviscerate Mary Lincoln as someone who could do no right. And then Tripp, in his coup de grace, compares her to psychopaths like Hitler. Tripp proclaims the marriage of Abraham and Mary ranks as one of the worst marital misfortunes in recorded history. <coughs> his flair for hyperbole presents as much of a problem as does his death before his book was published. Mary Lincoln as her husband's cross to bear is a popular refrain <coughs> Excuse me, echoing down through the ages of Lincoln scholars. I would suggest that, <coughs> excuse me, if Mary Lincoln had died in 1865, <coughs> perhaps not in an assassin's hand, but quietly in Chicago, what would her legacy be? <coughs> excuse me this Yankee air up here in Dallas. <coughs> we San Antonians are used to a warmer climate. <coughs> Certainly, her early demise would have spared her the old clothes scandal, <coughs> and there would have been no pension battles with debates on the congressional floor disparaging her. There would be no spiritualist photograph of the Lincolns. <coughs> And there would have been no commitment to Bellevue, an asylum in Batavia, Illinois. And perhaps she would have been showered with posthumous praise, but it was not to be. The final years of her life were filled with memories of loss, fighting the indignities. Thank you. Fighting the indignities of mm, age and decline. <laughs> Her reputation would fade with her death, but biographers would resurrect her, only to knock her down again. Thank you so much. <clears throat> in 2013, a headline in New York Magazine anoints Mrs. Lincoln the first lady of debt. The indictments that some historians have leveled against her appear disproportionately harsh and also employ that lens of hindsight. For example, <laughs> and this is my particular favorite. When a scholar lamented Mary Lincoln's shopping spree in the months leading up to Lincoln's assassination, he, and in the most egregious cases, it has been a he, 
as being quite unfair to his subject as the language betrays. Mary didn't have a timeline as to when her husband would be murdered. Mary did not know about this, unlike Imelda Marcos, with whom she was compared by the American press most lavishly in the 1980s, Mary Lincoln was not addicted to shoes. <clears throat> However, her serial and multiple glove purchases were nothing short of a mania. That I'm willing to concede. Incredible indictments continue that she was a scheming, criminal, even diseased person. In a 2003 volume, Mary Lincoln's physical ailments at the end of her life, one scholar suggests, I'll use the term scholar loosely here, one person suggests that her, this stemmed from the effects of syphilis. There was a harsh 19th century cure for venereal diseases, but this was not Mary's problem. Instead, her back, her eyesight, and many other attributes began to fail. But equally debilitating was the estrangement from her son her only remaining child, the fading memories of a happier day, the long drawn out deterioration of her physical stamina and her mental facilities. Mary Lincoln's character had undergone relentless repeated assaults. Although Lincoln was gone with a bullet within hours, Mrs. Lincoln's suffering stretched out for another 16 years. She was so miserable that she could not overcome the oceans of grief and the floods of sorrow that engulfed her. <coughs> Clearly many times when she was able to find some light in the darkness and beat back her despair, obstacles would intervene. She embraced the final escape of death and anticipated a reunion with her husband. And that might have been the end of it if Mary Lincoln could join the company of Sarah Polk and Florence Harding, strong-willed first ladies who fade into obscurity. But because of the meteoric rise of her husband's reputation, Mary Lincoln, like left luggage, is periodically reviewed and unpacked. She's always been judged by the standards of her cross-examiners. And once again, her character is proverbially toasted on coals. <coughs> now, I'm always very fascinated by these scholars who invest so much in Lincoln, his greatness, his foresight, his wisdom, and yet, how is it that he was such a hapless victim in his choice and character with his wife? We have to recognize that Mary's central role to his stability and her fostering his political prosperity was perhaps a choice, indeed wise one on his part. After they moved into the White House, whatever liability she presented during the Civil War, she was the lifelong companion with whom he hoped to pursue his dreams and spend the rest of his life. Now, I attended to make some sort of historical restitution with my 2009 biography, which was written on the foundations of previous work. <coughs> and I'm indeed indebted to that work. But more importantly, I undertook the project with the framework of what may, might be called a hostile work environment to lead up to the Lincoln Bicentennial when it seemed that Mary Lincoln haters were out in full force. We can never truly restore a reputation because once you're smeared in the headlines, the correction is on the inside pages in small type. It remains valuable, however, to expose the naked brutality of conspiratorial plots. Assassination in American history has complex dynamics which reflect tenacious patterns of folklore and storytelling. But in this sesquicentennial season, we should recognize there are layer upon layer of truths remaining for us to excavate. And not all truths will be self-evident. Certainly few will be equal to the fictions we continue to tell ourselves. Now, I've come to accept that not all truths will be politically correct. But as historians, we should strive toward those very awkward intersections when new truths might emerge. The past is always before us while historians continue to debate over their clashing interpretations. But it's my fervent hope that more than a century and a half after this tragedy of Abraham Lincoln's assassination, we can put on some new 3D specs to take in the fact that discrediting Lincoln's wife, pummeling her reputation, is a blood spart that has passed its due date. So in 2015, can we shift our attention onto the private rather than the public tragedy of Lincoln's passing? Abraham was gone, 
His wife and sons, like thousands of Americans, were bowed down from loss. But Mary Lincoln spent the rest of her days struggling with grief. <coughs> Today, we can recognize our battles and commit to rebuild. Mary Lincoln reflects more about our own times than those of Mrs. Lincoln. And as a biographer, I say, let us now praise difficult women. Thank you so much. Thank you for that applause, which allowed me to expel a small frog from my throat. So thank you. We have uh, our postdoc fellows, Evan McCormick and Tim Sale, on opposite sides of the room with microphones. So in the Q&A, if you'd wait for that mic to get to you so all of us can hear your question, uh, that'll help a lot. Thank you. So please, I did, <clears throat> believe it or not, shorten this talk to make it uh, something that I hope would provoke some questions from some of you who might want to ask more about Mr. or Mrs. Lincoln. I see we have a hand down here, a hand there. <coughs> this summer I visited uh, Robert Todd Lincoln's house in Manchester, Vermont. In Heldeen, right. A wonderful place if you ever get up to Manchester. And some of the literature I saw led me to believe that there was a reconciliation between him and, him and his, he and his mother. Yes, indeed, the reconciliation. Um, when um, the Lincoln's child, Mary, was born, uh, Robert's daughter, Mary, was born, and, and it was a child that, um, that Mary Lincoln very much was attached to. Uh, she believed it was named after her, ignored the fact that the child's mother was named Mary in her own <laughs> inimitable way. But estrangement from this grandchild seemed quite difficult. And Robert did, indeed, when his mother returned from her European sojourn, because the year she was released from uh, the, the asylum, first she went to her sister's home in Springfield, and then she went abroad, saying that she feared being recommitted, because indeed, um, there she was, um, a very intelligent, a well-educated uh, woman of wealth, and she thought privilege, and she found herself locked away, uh, her legal rights taken away. She got to get out of the asylum uh, by hook and crook, uh, by writing to lawyers and getting herself free, and then she escaped. She went abroad. But she did come back when she was ill, and we know that she kept uh, very much in touch with Robert, and I even found that she was following his political fortunes, because indeed another President Lincoln was something that uh, many of the party faithful were trying to promote. And she was, I think, someone who was willing to completely recolor the relationship again and again, but they did not have a close relationship. But Robert did indeed bring Mamie, the young daughter, to visit her grandmother in Springfield, and we know they did see one another during that period. So I've read that Mary Lincoln was um, very uh, uh, well read and knew politics very, very well. And um, did the, the politicians at that time know that she had this ability and that it was influencing the president? And did that have anything to do with how she was perceived? Well, I, I argue um, in my book and in sub subsequent articles I've done that she was indeed a very political woman. And as my good friend Liz Viren at the University of Virginia reminds us, there are parlor politics as well. Uh, other people have written about pillow uh, politics, but I think Mary really exercised um, a very strong tongue, very strong-minded. She was the daughter of a politician. Her sister in um, Illinois had married the son of a governor. Her sister in Kentucky, or half-sister, had married the son of a governor. She was used to being around politicians all the time. It greatly surprised me to discover when Lincoln ran for election in Illinois <coughs> early on, he was criticized as being a part of the Blue Bloods because he'd married into the Todd family. So he had access to these political circles. 
Mary frequently wrote about it. There, were, uh, there was a rumor of a duel that Lincoln undertook to defend uh, his honor when it was assumed that letters written in the newspaper anonymously might have been written about, uh, by Mary Todd. So indeed, we know that she probably wrote about politics. She held grudges. Remember, I, I emphasize that. There was a scene in the movie Lincoln where Mrs. Lincoln was seen in the balcony counting the votes in a small notebook in the way that screenwriters do. That was transposed, actually, from Mrs. Lincoln sitting in the um, balcony counting the votes when her husband was being considered for Senate. And she uh, found that he lost that vote, and uh, Lyman Trumbull went on, and she held it against his wife because she believed that His wife had influence. His wife was someone who knew the politics of it. So I found that very interesting to see that even in a Senate vote count in Illinois, this was something she was very invested in. When she was a young girl, she used to go sit on the bench um, next to the judge and, and hear trials, and she was really quite engaged. And I think that was seen as very sharp, threatening. When he was elected president, his circle was quite concerned because she exercised such influence. There was a politician named Norman Judd who very much wanted to be on the inner circle, but she remembered how he voted a few years before, and she found lots of interesting things to write back to her husband when she was in New York um, before going to Washington in the White House. So she did give a lot of political advice, but we don't have so many of those letters. As I said, they were... They were... <coughs> perhaps burned, but we also know that Robert, her son, was a very private person. We know he solicited letters, and we know that um, the many letters that he solicited have not yet turned up. There's all this rumor about the grates of Hildeen filled with the ashes, but I do think it's safe to say that he was a Victorian gentleman who believed in privacy. He was most angry when his mother's uh, machinations went public. And therefore, um, she did clearly often write compromising letters. And uh, she wrote letters and told people to burn them. So quite clearly, um, she was someone who was well aware that she was outside the circle of politics. But I do find it interesting whenever I go and I find First Lady books and First Lady issues. And of course, you know, Saturday Night Live, the cartoonists, that Mary Lincoln frequently appears there. And often as someone who is... <clears throat> exceeding her feminine sphere, and I think that is something that she quite clearly did and was perceived of at the time. This gentleman here. Yes, uh, why was Robert uh, not buried with the rest of the family in Springfield? Why was he not what? Yeah, why was he not entombed with the rest of the family in the mausoleum in Springfield? Oh, he's yes. the only one. He's the only member of the, of the children not, not <laughs> yes, there. Yes, because Mary Harlan Lincoln, his wife, um, very much resented the way in which the, the Lincolns exerted influence. And she wanted him buried in Arlington and saw to it that he would be the one Lincoln um, not buried there. And so this was something that and and also uh, Jack, their son, who tragically died. Um, is also buried there, I believe. So we do, we do have Mary Harl- The two Marys are, in a way, um, you know, persons who uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, sorry, I shouldn't use that phrase. Uh, it's Mary Todd and Mary Lincoln after she's married. Uh, in my book, I make the point there is not a single time that she ever used the Todd name in a signature or in even a. Uh, she didn't even use it in a monogram. Uh, But Todd became a really important addition to her name in the early 20th century when the Todd family began to emphasize Dolly Todd Madison and Mary Todd Lincoln. But Mary Lincoln was someone, I think, um, who we can very much appreciate, had a very distinctive persona, and she said that she picked out Senator Harlan's Mary for her son. And then when Senator... Harlan's Mary was married to her husband and began to exert some influence over um, boundaries with her mother-in-law. She very much resented that, and they really got to the point to where 
I would argue that that was one of the reasons why she was placed in a private asylum, not a public house, but a private asylum, because Robert was really caught between a difficult situation with his wife and his mother. Her breakdown occurring 10 years after the assassination and her breakdown occurring at a time when he was ill-equipped to handle uh, his grieved, uh, ravaged mother in his home with his wife and children. Right here. <clears throat> It was unavoidable to not be touched by her reaction because we're in Dallas after all and President Kennedy was shot here in the head and the widow had to accompany him back. Absolutely. And they were both from blue blood families and so. And I would say there are many parallels. I would say interestingly the way in which um, (coughs) St. Jacqueline was uh, assailed in the press was quite an interesting parallel. I mean there are were many interesting parallels. When I was writing this book, I was very struck by some of the pill- uh, the, the <clears throat> pillaging of, 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 not the pillaging, but the, the ransacking of the press that went on to dig up dirt on uh, the First Lady Hillary Clinton. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really struck by interesting parallels. In my book, I try and give, as I said, uh, a remedial view of Mrs. Lincoln in light of what I felt was... Um, a century of dispute. Um, however, there were some things I hope that I found, and one of them was, of course, the, the treatment at the time was unprecedented. There was no other First Lady that underwent the kind of scrutiny she did in the White House. And I think the other parallel is both presidents were at pivotal stages in civil rights development. That could be also true. I think people forget how hated Lincoln was in 1864 running for re-election, not just the South, but even in uh, New York City in the Republican Party, I would find letters where people would regularly refer to him as Ape Lincoln and use, um, you know, epithets. And so I think that was something I was was quite, you know, struck by at the time, the disrespect. But also, I was once visiting <clears throat> the town of Lenox, uh, Massachusetts, where I did a biography of another difficult woman, Fanny Kemble, and she lived in that town. And I was visiting a home, and I saw a portrait, a beautiful wedding <clears throat> portrait, of a Japanese bride and a very aristocratic New York husband. <clears throat> and I looked them up, and they were good friends. It might have even been that Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt had attended this wedding. And I was thinking, what would it have been like if Franklin Roosevelt had married a Japanese bride? (laughs) And he had been in the White House with his first lady on that infamous December 7th day. So I think we need to do parallels and imagine that Mrs. Lincoln was viewed as a Southern belle married to a Republican president that so many members of her family were serving in the Confederacy, in the rebellion. All of her letters incoming were read. All of the correspondence that left the White House was read. In other words, she was viewed as suspect within her own home. Yet she was intensely loyal to her husband. He was probably more judicious in allowing her sister, Ben Helm's widow, into the White House. Senators came in and started, um, started raising a ruckus by interrogating her sister, and she only stayed for a short time because it was viewed as so disruptive to have the um, wife of a Confederate war hero visiting his White House relative, his closest sister. So we did have this problem that, that the Mary Lincoln character had so many problems, and then I think the way in which she's been, as I said, I think mistreated in the sense that there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest, if everyone is always asking me, was she crazy? I think now historians in the turn of the century are dealing um, very sensitively with the fact that Abraham Lincoln clearly suffered from melancholy at a minimum, and several times during his life was confronted with crippling depression. He was, when he was 
in Springfield. Clearly, his friends worried about him. They went to his home and took away his razor. They visited him. Um, doctors were a great comfort to him. He often tried to get a post in South America to escape. So we, not often, he once tried to seek it out. So we know that he was someone who felt himself mercurial, and he'd been abandoned. His, his mother died, his sister died, and he clung to Mary, quite seriously saw her, I think, as someone who truly believed in him and gave him, I think, the anchor that he needed to rise. He could rise untethered because she always told him he was the best, and that little giant, Stephen Douglas, was no giant at all. So she was quite partisan in her, in her views. We have some people down front bravely raising their hands. I'm actually going to pass this back. I'm passing it back. Thank you. Thanks. I have an ancestor who was in the medical community in Washington, D.C. He was in medical school. It's always been part of our family lore that he was one of the physicians that came and treated Mary Lincoln. And I was also, curious. Yes, I'm sure he was. Because well, everyone just, wants their family lore. I know, I know. I haven't been able to find any <laughs> proof of that, but I was just <clears throat> wondering if you would comment on what the medical community did for her at the time. To, to comfort her during his yes. death. Yes. I mean, what kind of things did they treat her for? And, you know. Well, there's a lot of debate over what kind of medication she was on. I found when I was working on her um, grief and her uh, medical issues, there, there are no records, but one can explore them. I was most struck by the fact that um, Oliver Sacks was writing a, a series of of articles in the New York Times at that time about about taking medication, and uh, it seemed to me that he was describing some of the symptoms that that Mrs. Lincoln had been um, accused of uh, as evidence of her insanity at her insanity trial. That she thought she had an Indian inside her head pushing needles out. And as I read that, I thought, well, who hasn't had a migraine? I mean, it's very. You know, it's a very interesting way in which people are trying to express themselves. But I think um, I came to the conclusion that maybe some of the problem was that she took medication and perhaps also indulged in alcohol. And the mixture of alcohol and uh, specific drugs can actually lead to the kind of hallucinations that did indeed plague her at certain points. And also, of course, she became... Uh, she had anxiety attacks, she had hysteria. I'm perfectly willing to concede that these were episodes. But also, uh, we recently recovered um, through the intrepid scholarship of a, of a scholar named Jason Emerson some letters that she wrote from inside the asylum. But I find it so interesting because Jason published his <clears throat> book on, on her, of her letters. It's called The Madness of Mary Lincoln. And he read the letters one way, and I read the letters. A different way. So I think you know we can agree to disagree on these kinds of issues. Some people suggest that she was plagued by mental illness as a child because she was in the attic sometimes and in the cellar other times. And again, I say, really? And have you had any adolescent women in your home? Because I just feel as if some of the medical analysis of text is exaggerated. Just as I'm sure my critics think that I am always looking on a very positive light to try and give a contrasting view. But I, I say that I, I write and I create um, within the context that I'm given. And that is, again, when I would explain to people I was writing on Mary Lincoln, they would say, who is that? And I would have to say, Mary Todd Lincoln, then ah. And then the next question would be, was she crazy? So I would try and you know, write within the context of looking at at was she or wasn't she? What was the context? What was the medical issue? Um, she often wrote melodramatically saying, I'm looking out at the water and thinking of taking a walk and never returning. And there is an issue that her son allegedly thought she might commit suicide, which was why she was committed. And he, But my view is that I think if she was a candidate for suicide, it would have happened much earlier. We don't actually know much about suicide. It's something that I took up as a 
a subject after I uh, worked on Mrs. Lincoln. Um, I'm now working on a project on insanity, suicide, and Union soldiers during the American Civil War because there was so little secondary literature for me to, to look to to try and do a diagnosis of Mary Lincoln. But I think we're going to keep diagnosing Mary Lincoln and finding new illnesses. There was a wonderful program put on by the state of Illinois. Um, the Bar Association in Chicago brought people in and put Mrs. Lincoln on trial. They had put Mrs. Surratt on trial. And so we were redoing trials and looking at the evidence in, in light of our perspectives today. And it was, it was quite compelling. At one point, you had lawyers, you had doctors, you had psychiatrists, and at one point a psychiatrist was passionately saying he knew exactly what Mrs. Lincoln's problem was and that she had been madly overspending her husband's budget and a judge interrupted and said, well, excuse me, but I'm in court every day and I would say if you're going to put people away for overspending their husband's budget that <laughs> the city of Chicago would be needing to build many more asylums. So we did really, you know, we did really sort of joke about it, but not because in other words there is, as we know, a double speak going on. We watch it in presidential candidates and issues in the 1860s and I think we see it in a campaign now. Yes, Professor Nock. What did you think of Sally Fields? <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say, I just have to say that, you know, it is, it was such a pleasure to meet with her because it's such a thrill for a biographer to meet someone who is more obsessed with the person you've been living with than you are because she really wanted to <clears throat> understand and inhabit Mrs. Lincoln, to really try to give a feeling for her. And I was really completely mesmerized by what I thought she showed were dimensions of Mrs. Lincoln that I had not imagined. And I thought the depth of, of her disturbances, especially in the early scenes of the movie, were, were really powerful and really quite wonderful. Um, I also thought the costumes were fantastic. I worked with the costume designer and um, tell a story that I found one of the dresses in the Chicago Historical Society that <clears throat> was a Mrs. Lincoln day dress. And it was amazing how they made the cloth, made the dress, Sally Field put it on, didn't look right on camera. They remade the cloth, they remade the dress, and that's on the cutting room floor because that's what happens in films. But Sally Field, I think, did such a magnificent job inhabiting that particular role and I, was very, very grateful to be invited in a small way to have any influence because all the books written about Lincoln are out there and being read by a hungry audience here and elsewhere, but the power of a film portrait is, is quite important and I was really pleased that she did such a wonderful job. Not that I didn't like the Mary Lincoln of Lincoln the <clears throat> vampire slayer because I thought <laughs> I thought anything that will get people into the topic and reading about, reading about Lincoln and reading about campaigns against slavery and his role, you know, was really powerful. And also, um, Mrs. Lincoln was interested and invested in that film in the politics, and I thought that showed. And it was one of the few portraits I've seen which also showed what I suggested in my book was central, that a lot of her unstable behavior near the end of the war stemmed from the fact that her husband sent her firstborn into uniform with the person she referred to as that butcher Grant. So it was really a, a brawl on the home front and I thought it was captured well in that film. So. So I know that Robert, Can or Robert Lincoln had money. I'm not sure if he did when, when uh, Mrs. Lincoln was, left the White House. He did not come to his mother's aid at all when she was selling. Oh, Robert, had, was, no, Robert had no money in, well, in that he was a, a, a law student. He was, 
he was, they were all waiting to inherit from their father, and it was in the headlines how much money he had. Well, I'm just thinking of Hildine. Oh, well, later, of course, through his connections, he was Assistant Secretary of, uh, of State, I believe, or was it War? Sorry, Assistant Secretary of War. And um, uh, he had actually been with Garfield physically at Union Station when Garfield was assassinated. He later was on his way to Buffalo with McKinley. So uh, <laughs> there, there, are, there are rumors about Robert... Lincoln, but let me say that his support of his mother was that he was a dutiful Victorian son who found his mother's behavior. She wouldn't leave the White House for weeks. Uh, They went to Chicago, where she was clearly uh, in grief, in mourning, disproportionate. She was desperate about money. He had to live with her during a time when she was the most erratic and, um, you know, quite, quite, an imbalanced. My um, my good friend Stephen Barry says that she suffered from financial bulimia, that she would spend and then she would sorrow and she was really someone. But the old clothes scandal, which happened in 1867, was because Elizabeth Keckley had come out to Chicago to visit her. And Keckley had been such a great confidant and a great friend, but she uh, happened to be in Chicago and she saw uh, an auction, a charity auction for the um, children of Civil War veterans, the orphans. And at this auction was a wrap, a dresser that she had made for Verena Davis. And this really struck her at a point because also Mrs. Lincoln vowed when she left the White House she would never wear anything but black again. So she was traveling with several dozen trunks of her White House goods which was completely legal at the time. She took away her private goods. And at that time, people gave the president carriages, clocks. Uh, This was part of the uh, general, not bribery, but just part of the uh, protocol that went on during this period. And she took these things, and she had these trunks of clothing that she would never wear again. And there she was with her two sons. And it presented to her the idea that these could be sold anonymously and they would make money for her because she was waiting for the estate to settle. The old clothes scandal was so awful in the headlines. Robert was particularly furious with her for going to New York, for trying to sell her clothes, for having it get out, for the clothes being put on display on Broadway. And here is the first lady's uh, uh, wardrobe being exposed. It was really a horror for him. And she never ended up making any money on a sale, and she never uh, ended doing anything but alienating him even more, and also alienating the affections of the government at that time, because there was a campaign headed by Charles Sumner, who was a great fan of hers, to get her a pension, and she eventually did get a pension. She was the first presidential widow to obtain a pension, and um, so... I think he financially was not in a position to help his mother. I think he helped her as much as he could at the time, but he couldn't give her what she needed at the time. Well, I thought at the time that she was selling her clothing and her jewelry that she was destitute. So maybe I'm wrong. Did she have a woman friend that was the champion of hers that you could just say one person that really stood by her? Well, I think the story of of her, her relationship with Elizabeth Keckley is quite poignant because Elizabeth Keckley, um, who was the premier dressmaker in Washington at the time, an African-American woman who'd bought her own freedom and worked her way up the ladder in the free black community in Washington. And Elizabeth Keckley uh, was someone who was indeed her confidant, indeed her, her, I think, um, to say friend is a complicated issue because they had an employee-employer relationship. But she went with her to Chicago, and she really was very much her champion. She then actually published her own story in order to set the record straight on Mary Lincoln, because most of the staff in the White House, the African-American staff, thought of Mary Lincoln in a supportive way. I mean, Mrs. Lincoln had actually challenged the protocol at the White House by taking an African-American woman in the front door, talking with her about charity, complaining to the doorman who turned her away, um, publicly uh, I- embraced a woman in front of the White House, which caused a scandal. So she, she was someone, I think, who let Mrs. Keckley influence her. But when the book came out and when Robert 
went especially ballistic over this issue of Mrs. Lincoln's life being exposed through her dressmaker. Um, she disavowed her, and they never met again, spoke again, and died alienated. And that, I think, was a very sad thing. Her own older sister, Elizabeth, I think, who had been a substitute mother for her, was probably her closest confidant. And she indeed returned to that home of her sister in Springfield, um, the very same home where she was married to Mr. Lincoln. And she died upstairs from the parlor. And um, in a very, I think, uh, sad way, was finally reconciled with that sister. But no, I don't think she had one of the best friends and champions that we hoped that she would have been served by. So I think I'm getting a signal question. here. Uh, there's a person who really fascinated my historical memory. I would like to know what role, if any, did she play in Lincoln's <coughs> issuing of his most renowned proclamation? Well, there were a parade of Lincoln scholars who wanted to know the exact influence that she did or didn't have over the Emancipation Proclamation. I could find no telling information that would lead to my belief that she played a champion of the Emancipation, except I would say that her uh, her visiting contraband, giving money, camp, contraband camps, her visiting African American charities, her relationship with Mrs. Keckley shows that she was very strongly in favor of uh, a, a pro anti slavery policy on the part of the administration and championed her husband on that. She had two grandmothers that had freed all of their slaves. That was something that, that she spoke about. But all of the evidence is post war. You see, so it has her indeed championing her legacy afterwards. However, she was the one who gave a cane to Frederick Douglass. She was the one who gave artifacts to Elizabeth Keckley, who later gave them to Wilberforce. So much of the Lincoln memorabilia that went out at that time went out to African Americans because Mrs. Lincoln, in 1865, began a very deliberate campaign of linking her husband's legacy to that of African-American freedom. So I can't really give an answer to the emancipation question because I didn't find any after digging, but I can say that I do believe that she did much to elevate her husband's reputation as the, quote, emancipator for good or ill. It's a great note to end on. Abigail Fillmore was the first First Lady to work outside the home, teaching in a private school.